You argue that the suite of feelings we might refer to as romantic love isn't one thing, but three separate phenomena. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. Um, well, I think we've evolved. I don't even think I've been able to prove that we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. One is the sex drive, the craving for sexual mm -hmm. gratification, linked largely with testosterone, foremost with testosterone in both men and women. The second is romantic love. Uh, and we've been able to prove, I and my colleagues uh, doing brain scanning, that that is really driven by the neurotransmitter dopamine. And the third basic brain system is attachment, that sense of calm and security you can feel with a long-term partner. And other scientists have been able to prove that that's been largely linked with oxytocin and vasopressin. So the three basic brain systems, they evolved to do different things. I mean, the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. I mean, you can have sex with somebody you're not uh, in love with. Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy on just one individual at a time and start the real mating process. And that third feeling, uh, that brain system for attachment evolved to enable you to stick with this person at least long enough to raise a single child uh, through infancy together. So the three different brain systems, and uh, they interact in a great many ways, uh, which I'm happy to go into. But uh, yes, basically three brain systems. Sex drive, romantic love, and feelings of deep attachment. Right. And while there does seem to be a kind of standard lust to attraction to attachment pipeline, uh, you argue that we can run through these in any order. Am I correct? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought that up because the press constantly gets that wrong. You know, there's all kinds of people who've fallen madly in love with somebody who they've never had sex with. Mm. Uh, and then they go and have sex with them. And then they begin to feel feelings of deep attachment. Or they are, are deeply attached to somebody at school or at work or in the neighborhood or among their friends. And and they never think of uh, romantic love with them. And then times change. People get divorced. Uh, uh, people um, uh, die. Uh, people break up. And, um, you know, you suddenly go out with an old friend and they say just the hilarious thing at just the right moment. And you trigger that brain circuitry for romantic love. Hmm. Or you can start out just having sex with somebody. I mean, uh, you know, um, friends with benefits is, is extremely common these days. I mean, the pandemic has changed it to some extent. But prior to the pandemic, all of my data showed that a good 35% of people had sex with somebody before the first date. <laughs> right. And um, I regard these as sort of sex interviews. I mean, you learn a lot between the sheets. I'm not advocating <laughs> it, but that's you right. know, not just whether they're any good in bed, but whether they're patient, whether they're kind, whether they've got a sense of humor, et cetera. So these, base, these are brain systems. They're not phases. You can have sex with somebody, and that can trigger the brain circuitry for romantic love. I mean, you know, any stimulation of the genitals will drive up the dopamine system and can potentially push you over that threshold into feelings of intense romantic love. And then with um, orgasm, there's a real flood of oxytocin linked with feelings of attachment. The, this is one reason that I say, you know, it, casual sex is not casual unless you're so drunk, you know, you can't remember it. <laughs> Something is going on in your brain. So bottom line is um, we've evolved three different brain systems. Uh, they can interact in any way and in any order. So I want to double click really um, briefly on a couple of things you mentioned there. So you talked about people going from a friends with benefits type situation into a more romantic situation. Is this a kind of reversal of typical human courtship, right? Like starting with sex and using that as part of like the extended selection process? Yeah, you know, I um, I wrote an academic article on this called Slow Love, uh, Courtship in the Digital Age. And I've looked at the last 11 years of of data, academic data on courtship in America, because I do this annual study called Singles in America. I do it with Match, the dating site, but we do not poll the Match members. It's a national representative sample of singles based on the U.S. Census. And every year until the pandemic, every year, what we really see the new courtship pattern is they start out as just friends or we're just friends. Then they move slow, get to know each other. Then they move slowly into friends with benefits, learn a lot between the sheets, as I said, and then they go out on the first date. So um, as I mentioned, I think something like 34 to 35% of singles had had uh, friends with benefits before 
the official first day. So these days it has been just friends for a period of time, uh, moving into friends with benefits, not all of them, but a good third of them, then moving into the first official date, then slowly telling friends and family, then slowly moving in together, and then at the finale, um, you know, uh, getting married. And in fact, I'm I'm very positive about this because uh, I've looked in without match, but uh, by myself, at um, the demographic yearbooks of the United Nations from 1947 to 2011 was the last I looked. And the longer you court and the later you wed, the more likely you are to remain together. And that's exactly mm. what we've been seeing in America, what I call slow love. This being just friends, friends with benefits, moving into a, uh, um, a courtship and then finally wedding way down the road. You know, we used to marry... Yeah, fifty years ago, people used to marry in their very early twenties. Now they're marrying in their very late twenties or even early thirties. And this does argue for that we I think we're gonna usher in, we're doing it now, um, relative family stability for a few uh decades, simply because we're courting for so long and marrying so much later. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And you you're right that when you look at um I was just looking at a study of the divorce curve showing that it has kind of that J shape where it declines until 30 um, before starting to pick up again in mm. terms of uh, first marriage. But I want to follow up on something you said earlier in this discussion of kind of the modern West, or I, I don't know if this is cross-cultural, but certainly Western mating pattern. And I don't want to read too much into it, but you said that you don't recommend um, learning about a partner through um, between the sheets, as you said. Um, is that to say that you actively recommend against it or are you just ambivalent on it? I'm just being polite, frankly. <laughs> I mean, I, I think sex is good for you. I really do. I think you learn mm. a lot. I really do. But I don't want the world screaming, oh, Helen Fisher's saying we should all shack up together. I mean, the bottom line is, <laughs> you know, in this day and age, I mean, you do learn a lot from having sex with – good sex with somebody is, by the way, extremely good for you. Um, but I mean, it's good for the body. I mean, it, well, I want to tell you why, but the bottom line is, I mean, these days, most singles are not scared of getting diseases. They know how to handle that. They're right. not scared of getting pregnant. They know how to handle that. And they don't have to walk the walk of shame. They, nobody cares or very few people care. But one thing that I, you know, you said, well, what about courtship? You know, maybe it's just the Western world that is doing, um, these courtship patterns. And I talked to uh, journalists from all over the world. I recently had one in China, uh, one in Russia, and one in Brazil. And I always ask them a lot of questions because they live in the culture. And what they will say, particularly in China, uh, they say is, well, the people in the cities, people who've gone and moved to the cities, are expressing the same patterns of courtship as Westerners are. It's only in the villages and in, in the farming hinterlands that uh, they're still marrying very early, marrying very rapidly, uh, until death do us part. Mm. And what do you think about that alternative in terms of a mating strategy of like kind of having the perfect reversal where you go through the romantic love, but you're not having sex with them. Um, you maybe even get to the attachment stage. Um, but if you have a really extended courtship still without having sex with them, and then you finally get married, um, and start to reproduce. This was of course, kind of what was expected, um, under the Christian worldview for some time and still in some communities. What do you think about that as an alternative um, mating strategy? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm not really in the should business. I'm not in the business of telling yeah. anybody what to do or not to do. But um, I would not go into a long-term partnership without having kissed and hugged somebody. I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, only because uh, I regard sex as an important part of a, of a partnership. And by the way, you know, we were just talking, sex is very good for you. I mean, any kind of, when you have sex with somebody, you're driving up the androgens, including testosterone, giving you more of a sex drive. You are releasing the dopamine, uh, uh, which can really help with feelings of romantic love. And then with um, orgasm, you're really uh, releasing oxytocin linked with feelings of attachment. So when you're having good sex with somebody, you're triggering all three brain systems, the sex drive to have more, romantic love, uh, which is brings optimism, focus, motivation. Romantic love is very good for the for the body and the mind. I guess uh, you heard it here first. Dr. Helen Fisher recommends sex if you need any <laughs> convincing. <laughs>